Hello again, folks, and welcome to another exciting episode of Forward into the Past. I'm J.C. Rade, your host and narrator, and today we're finishing up the final two chapters in the 1915 Nick Carter mystery, The Call of Death, or Nick Carter's Clever Assistant. In the last episode, after Nick Carter came home from interviewing main suspect Kate Crandall, his assistant Chick Carter was waiting there to give Nick the update on the mystery man left for dead in a house in Harlem. After comparing notes, Nick discovers that the dead mystery man is James Nordick, the man at the center of the Westchester bank robbery. He soon surmises that James's daughter Nancy knows where the stolen money is and is the very person who visited the missing Reverend Maybrick. Before being able to move forward on this angle, Nick receives an odd telephone message and is instantly on the run. Meanwhile, Nick's second assistant, Patsy, has managed to get on gangster Turk McGill's good side, and he and Turk have kidnapped Kate Crandall and have sped off to an unknown distant location in the woods to try to get her to tell the bank crooks where the money is hidden. How is Patsy going to get out of this alive? And what does Nick know to have him race away with such speed? Well, gang, here we go. The thrilling conclusion of The Call of Death, or Nick Carter's Clever Assistant. Chapter 8. Patsy's Clever Work Gridley led the way into a large square room. Like the exterior of the grim stone house, it bore all the earmarks of antiquity. Great beams crossed the faded ceiling. The discolored walls were partly wainscoted. A smoldering log burned in a huge stone fireplace. The furnishings in the room were old and threadbare. An oil chandelier lighted the scene. It was suspended above a table on which were several newspapers and a few old books. Also, a telephone, the only modern fixture in the room. Kate Crandall was seated on an old sofa, still bound and gagged, and in charge of Blink Morgan, but apparently nerved to meet whatever might follow. Sit down, Dolan, till I'm ready to talk with you, Gridley commanded when all hands had entered the room. Now, Turk, out with the whole business. Where did you pick him up and why? I'll tell you where and why he... Patsy began. You keep quiet, Gridley sharply interrupted. You'll have your say, Dolan, when the time comes. Sit down and close your trap till you're asked to open it. Sure thing, if that's the way you feel about it, Patsy coolly acquiesced. He saw plainly that Gridley not only was the leader of the gang, but also that he ruled with a rod of iron. He realized, too, that he might not be able to blind Gridley as successfully as he had fooled McGill, and Patsy immediately set about casting an anchor to the windward. He had caught sight of the telephone on the table. He took a chair near it. He knew that he could not use it in any ordinary way, yet he felt that he might craftily turn it to some advantage. He also knew, of course, nothing of the discoveries Chick had made and the theory Nick was, at that moment, elucidating in his business office in Madison Avenue. But he did know, at least, that any communication to their office would speedily reach one of them, if not both. There's nothing for me in holding up this gang before I get wise to their game, he reasoned, while McGill was hurriedly explaining what had occurred, which then held the entire attention of his three confederates. I'll wait till I get next to the whole business and then decide what to do, Patsy added to himself. I can pick it up all right when they begin to talk with this woman. Gee whiz, but I don't fancy that. Furtively watching Gridley while McGill was stating how they had met and what had followed, Patsy detected a steadily deepening frown on Gridley's hard-set face. It smacked of incredulity, of increasing misgivings, and Patsy scented trouble. That infernal rascal is not going to swallow my story without somebody to wash it down he thought a bit grimly. I must sharpen up my wits and be ready for him if he starts in to put me through the ringer. By Jove, I'll have something else ready, too. I reckon I can work it undetected. McGill was still talking earnestly to his three confederates. Patsy leaned nearer the table, resting one arm on it, and stealthily placed three of the books in a pile and gradually drew them close to his elbow. He accomplished this just as McGill ended his story when Gridley replied with a doubtful growl and a side glance at Patsy. It strikes me, Turk that you have taken long chances. Chances, said McGill, frowning. Yes, you really know nothing about it. Only what he told me. That may not be true. But the circumstances and what he has done are all right as far as they go, Gridley curtly interrupted. But they are not enough. We must be dead sure of him. 
We must find out just who he is and where... Say, are you ginks talking about me? Patsy cut in with affected resentment. Yes, we're talking about you, snapped Gridley. You're a stranger to us. We might get in wrong, you know, in blindly relying upon a stranger. Oh, is that so? Patsy retorted. And I might throw a shoot, too, by helping a strange gang in such a game as you guys are playing. What do you want, my pedigree? See here, Dolan. Oh, I'm seeing all there is to see, cried Patsy, frowning. You'll find out, maybe, that I'm a law and order spotter or a central office sleuth. It would cost you something all right if we did. You guys give me a pain. I'll tell you right now. I'll show you the way, Patsy forcibly added, seizing the telephone for a moment, but quickly replacing it on the table. There is one man who can tell you all about me. He will give it to you straight, he quickly went on, now shouting with pretended resentment. Call up 47 Madison. 47 Madison. Here, I'll write it for you on the edge of this newspaper so you'll make no mistake. 47 Madison. Ask who Jack Dolan is, and... Dry up, snapped Gridley, interrupting, while McGill, Morgan, and Phelan stared from one to the other. I'll not telephone anybody. You keep cool, Dolan, and answer my questions. This is nothing for you to get hot about. Who is the party anyway? He runs a bar room near Madison Avenue, said Patsy curtly. What's his name? Jim Donovan. He knows all about me. He'll tell you who I am and whether you can bank on me. Sure, Ginger, we can bank on him, McGill now cried impatiently. He's all right, or he wouldn't have let me a hand to get the skirt. That's right, too, Morgan chimed in confidently. He'll go to limit, Ginger. You can bet on that. So he will, perhaps. But there was no harm in making sure of it, Gridley now said less harshly, evidently impressed with these arguments and the attitude Patsy had taken. He ought not to kick at that. Oh, he's not kicking. He's all right, Gridley, from his toes up, McGill insisted. He knows what he's doing. The blinded rascal never spoke more truthfully. Patsy already had turned one of the cleverest tricks of his exceedingly clever career. All the while, during the heated discussion, which had absorbed the entire attention of the four crooks, Patsy had been tapping with his lead pencil on the metal mouthpiece of the telephone. He had so placed the instrument near the pile of books that they lifted the receiver sufficiently to let its hook rise and make a connection with the number he had thrice shouted, chiefly, of course, for the ears of the exchange operator. The position of the telephone was not suggestive of the ruse. One would have observed only by chance that the books raised the receiver. The tapping with a pencil was not noticed by either of the four crooks. The quick intermittent taps sped instantly over the wire. They were the taps distinctly heard by Nick Carter in his business office. They conveyed to him what Patsy could not vocally impart, this tapped communication by the ordinary telegraphic code, which Nick and all his assistants were perfectly familiar. Cornered, Stone House, Baldwin Road, Westchester, half mile east of Granger Settlement, Rush, will hold up gang if... Patsy had ended it abruptly. He saw Gridley's evil eyes cast towards him. He dropped his pencil, and with his elbow, as if by accident, he quickly upset the telephone and prevented the detection of his exceedingly artful ruse. Turning quickly to catch the falling instrument, however, Patsy met with a mishap that threatened to pervert all of the good work he had done. His hasty movements caused something to drop from his vest pocket. It fell to the floor near the chair. He did not see it, but instantly caught the eye of Turk McGill. The $20 banknote said to have been used for the automobile hire. It gave McGill's confidence a sudden, terrible jolt. His faith in Dolan oozed out of every pore. He flashed a swift, significant glance at Gridley, then walked carelessly back of Patsy's chair, only to turn quickly and seize him from behind, confining his arms and crying sharply, Sit quiet! If you're all right, Dolan, you have nothing to fear! But here's the but! It was a big revolver in the hand of Ginger Gridley. He sprang up when Patsy began to struggle, thrusting the weapon directly under his nose and adding fiercely, Sit quiet as you're told, or I'll put you in shape for an undertaker. We'll soon find out who you are and whether you're on the level. Bring a piece of rope, Phelan, and tie him to the chair. Be quick about it. Oh, very well, said Patsy coolly. But what's this all about? Have your noodle boxes gone wrong? Why the sudden change of mind, McGill? McGill did not reply immediately. He waited until Phelan came with a piece of rope with which Patsy's arms were quickly bound to the back of the chair. He then picked up the banknote, quickly displaying it, and crying, You have lied to me once, Dolan, and your whole story may be a string of lies as Gridley suspects. You said you paid for the car with this money. You lied. This is the same banknote I gave you. So tis, said Patsy with dry terseness. But don't let that worry you, McGill. Never worry over picking up a twenty case. 
you're dead lucky to get it back. Patsy now saw plainly enough what had occasioned this sudden aggressiveness. He saw, too, that the moment was fast approaching when subterfuge would be utterly futile, when even his identity might be discovered, and he at once took the only course left open for him, that of prolonging the conversation and staving off any desperate move of these rascals until his combination telephone and telegraph appeal could be answered. For, though the telephone receiver was muffled by its position on the books, Patsy had faintly heard Nick's repeated hello and recognized his voice, and he felt reasonably sure from his succeeding silence that the tapped message had been received and rightly interpreted. McGill's face, like that of every man of the gang, had taken on a frown as black as midnight. He shook the back note in Patsy's face, retorting fiercely, Lucky to get it back, am I? Well, you'll be mighty lucky to get out of here with your life if we find out that you have tricked us. Oh, I have not tricked you, Patsy calmly asserted. You're getting all haired up over nothing. I'll explain to your satisfaction, McGill, if you give me time. It was, for time indeed, that Patsy then was playing. Out with it, then, snarled Gridley, again taking the ribbons. What do you mean? How came you with this money? McGill gave it to me. But you said you hired the touring car with it. No, I didn't, said Patsy. He only thought I did. The truth is, Mr. Gridley, I hated to let go of twenty bucks that had come so easy. So I hung on to the long green instead and stole the touring car from in front of a house. I ordered you not to steal one, cried McGill. I know it, said Patsy with a grin, but I ain't much on obeying orders. I reckoned a stolen car would service as well for the job we had framed up, and since I was going into the thieving game, I thought I might as well swipe a car and be hung for a sheep as a lamb. He's lying, Gridley said sternly. See what else he has in his pockets. Search him from head to foot, and... What's that? McGill had quickly obeyed, thrusting his fingers into Patsy's vest pockets. From one of them he drew out a crumpled scrap of paper, thoughtlessly put there by Patsy after having read it. It's a leaf from a notebook, he cried. Here's writing on it. Writing on it? Thundering guns, whom are we up against? McGill added with a growl. Listen, Gridley, listen. McGill straightened up with lips viciously twitching and read it aloud, the communication from Nick Carter to Patsy. Kate Crandall knows, but will not speak. Shadow her constantly until otherwise directed. Be governed by circumstances. I am off for home. Phone me there of any discoveries. Oh, gee whiz, it's all off now for fair, thought Patsy. I'm booked for all I've invited unless the chief shows up. There certainly were indications of it. Gridley snatched the paper from McGill and read it himself, then uttered a terrible oath. This does settle it, he fiercely muttered. A detective, that's what he is. Sure thing, snarled McGill. Search him from head to foot, Phelan. We must find out who he is and where we stand. See if that hair is his own and... Ah, it's not his own, eh? Off with it, Phelan, the whole business. Phelan set to work with vicious zest, and in a very few minutes he not only had Patsy stripped of his disguise, but also the contents of his pockets spread upon the table, handcuffs, searchlight, two revolvers, a well-filled pocketbook, a handkerchief, keys, and other minor articles. None of them bore his name and address, however, nor did Nick's brief, though very significant note, bear his signature. A cry of increasing rage broke from McGill when the truth thus was forced upon him, but Gridley checked him with a gesture, saying sternly, You keep quiet, Turk, and let me handle this fellow. But blast him! There aren't any buts! I'm chief of this gang, snapped Gridley, and what I say goes. I'll wring the truth out of him, you can bet on that, and we then shall know where we stand. Now, tell me at once, who are you? The last was fiercely addressed to Patsy, but Patsy was undisturbed by his ferocity. He met his fiery gaze with a frigid stare, replying indifferently, Jack Dolan, just as I've told you. That's a lie, snapped Gridley. You'd say that if I told you the truth, so I might as well hand you one name as another. Oh, is that so? You mean, then, that you won't tell me? I already have told you. Huh, let it go at that, then, for the present, said Gridley with ominous severity. Who gave you this note? The party who wrote it, said Patsy dryly. What's his name? I don't know, Mr. Gridley, on the dead. It has slipped my mind. Hang him, cried McGill impatiently. He's giving us the laugh. String him up and force him to answer. You keep quiet, Gridley again commanded. Then to Patsy, why were you told to shadow this woman? That hasn't slipped your mind? 
No, sure thing, said Patsy, with a glance at Kate Crandall. I can remember that all right. Out with it, then. Why were you told to shadow her? To find out where she went, Patsy dryly admitted. By heaven, if you don't loosen up and tell me, I'll find a way to make you, Gridley thundered. Who gave you this note? To whom are you to telephone any discoveries you make? He broke off abruptly, hit with a sudden idea, and turned sharply around to his listening confederates. What was that number he mentioned? he cried. Can you remember it? Sure, cried Blink Morgan. Four, seven, Madison. Get that telephone book, Gridley pointed at the table. Look for police headquarters. See if that's their number. Rats, growled Phelan. He ain't a police sleuth. He's no plain clothesy. I know that push. Try the private agencies, then, snapped Gridley. Look up. Stop a bit. Begin with Nick Carter. Try him. Look up his number. Holy smoke, thought Patsy. Here's where the cat makes her final jump. She'll come clean out of the bag this time, but the rascals do not suspect the trick I put over on them. That sure is my only anchor to the windward. Morgan and Turk McGill had turned pale when Nick Carter's name was mentioned, and their fears were completely verified. For Phelan, suddenly starting up from the telephone book he was hurriedly inspecting, cried out excitedly, I've got it! Here's the name and number! 47 Madison! It's a telephone in Nick Carter's business office! <sighs> Last jump is right, thought Patsy. Gridley swung round and gazed at him with murder in his eye. So, Nick Carter wrote this note, did he? said he through his teeth. You're the telephone with discoveries to him, hey? What have you discovered? What has he got on us? Nothing on you that I know of, said Patsy unruffled. I was not directed to shadow you fellas. What on this woman, then? I don't know for sure, and I don't think he does, Patsy truthfully answered, not yet informed of Nick's deductions and suspicions. That's dead straight goods, Gridley, on my word. Gridley vented an oath and shaped another course. Make sure that he is securely tied, Phelan, he cried sternly. We'll settle his hash a little later. Our first move must be to get the coin, and get it mighty quick if Carter is dipping into this business. That's right, too, McGill declared, glaring at Patsy. Get the coin and bolt. That's our only safe course. We'll take it, too, and take it on the jump, Gridley forcibly added. Free that woman, Morgan, and be quick about it. She shall tell us what she knows, or God help her. Chapter 9 The Last Call Kate Crandall had not stirred from the sofa during the sensational scenes just enacted. They told her only too plainly that she was in the hands of knaves who would shrink from no desperate deed that would serve their ends, and she had no thought but to escape from them by any means she could command. Blink Morgan hastened to liberate her, while Gridley seated himself directly in front of her, and sternly said, "'You've got mighty few minutes, woman, to tell us what we want to know.' We have others here who could tell us, but whose traps are tightly closed. We've not killed them lest we might kill our golden goose, but understand this. We'll end them, and you too, unless you give us the information which— Kate Crandall checked him with a haughty gesture. One moment, Mr. Gridley, if that's your name, she said coldly. I can tell you with very few words all that I know. You will believe me, I think, though this man refused to do so. She glanced at McGill, but— he made no comments. "'You were seen two nights ago by him and Morgan,' said Gridley, sternly eyeing her. "'They had followed a girl to the home of a clergyman named Maybrick. They saw her look through his library window and then enter his house. They would have listened at his window to her interview with him, but you got there first, and they could not do so without taking risks, then thought to be needless. We must know what the girl told him. It's up to you to tell us.' You heard what she said, or you would not have remained to listen. That is true, Kate coldly admitted. I heard all that she said to Mr. Maybrick. Tell me, said Gridley sternly. She told him that her father had recently died, that he was a criminal, and had forced her to be one, but that she now was determined to reform. She told him that her father was one of a gang that had recently robbed a bank, and that he had had charge of the stolen funds, and had buried them, confiding to her their hiding place while on his deathbed. That's the point, said Gridley. That's the very thing we want to know, where the plunder is hidden. I cannot tell you. Not tell me? Why not? Because I do not know. The girl did not inform Mr. Maybrick. What did she say about it? She said she would take him to the spot, and that he could then remove the funds and restore them to the bank. She would not then reveal the hiding place. 
Did she give him no hint? No, none, said Kate. She appointed a place for him to meet her last evening, which he promised to do so. That is all I can tell you. Is that true? God hearing me, it is true, Kate solemnly declared. I cannot possibly give you the information you expected from me. I do not know. Stop! I believe you, Gridley cried curtly. Then, turning to Blink Morgan, he harshly commanded, Bring the jade up here, Blink, and a gospel sharp with her. I'll find a way to force her to speak. Morgan seized a lamp and hastened from the room. Patsy heard him descending the cellar stairs a moment later. By thunder, this is the gang that cracked the Westchester Savings Bank, he said to himself. Gee whiz, there's half a million at stake. If the chief was right, Jim Nordick must be the man who buried the plunder, and the girl in question must be Nancy Nordick. Patsy did not realize just then, however, how perfectly right Nick Carter had sized up the entire case. This appeared a moment later when Nancy Nordick and the missing rector were led into the room, both with their arms securely bound behind them. The Reverend Austin Maybrick was quite pale, but he carried himself with dignity, and his fine face wore a look of scorn that told little how he feared the threatening situation. He appeared surprised when he saw Kate Crandall and Patsy, but he did not speak. Gridley hardly noticed him. He turned at once to the girl who had entered and then leaned wearily against the nearest wall. She was a slender, poorly clad girl, who looked ten years older than she really was. Her dark brown hair was in disorder, her eyes deeply ringed, but her features were regular and would have been quite attractive, but for a wan and pinched look that told of dejection, suffering, and more of care and misery than often falls upon one of her years. She also was surprised at seeing Patsy and Kate Crandall, but it appeared only in the sharper glint of her large, expressive eyes, which flashed from one to another, though chiefly at Gridley, with a look of mingled determination and defiance that evinced a fearless spirit in her frail form. Gridley turned to her with lowering gaze, saying harshly, You're surprised at seeing others here, ain't you? Nancy Nordick gave him look for look, with her thin gray lips curling contemptuously. She drew herself up a little, replying with a sinister slang that evinced her lack of refinement. Not on your life, Gridley. I wouldn't be surprised at any scurvy trick that you pulled off. What do you want, now that you brought him and me from the cellar? I'd sooner stay down there than be in the same room with you. Cut out that lobscouse, commanded Gridley sternly. I'm going to show you where you stand and where these persons stand whom you've drawn into this mess. I'm going to force you or them to tell me where your double-dealing dad hid that plunder. Oh, you are, Nancy exclaimed derisively. You'll get fat trying to force that out of me. You can't get it out of them or anyone else, for I've told no one. I handed you that at first, but it seems you can't swallow it. I'm the only one who knows where the stuff is planted. That is true, absolutely true, said Maybrick with habitual dignity. I don't know why you have brought this other woman here, but you— What you don't know cuts no ice with us, Gridley sharply interrupted. You keep quiet, or I'll find a way to make you. There's a bunch of sleuths on this case who may make trouble for us at any moment, and I'm in no mood to mince matters. This infernal jade, if she's the only one who knows, is going to tell me where to find that plunder. Oh, is that so, Gridley? questioned Nancy with eyes flashing. You'll find it so. And you'll find it isn't, snapped the girl defiantly. You put that idea out of your block. It might turn you batty. See here, Gridley, she added with sudden display of deeper feeling. I've been a bad egg most of my life. It come to me natural, and my old man forced me into it. He's dead now, and I stood by alone and saw the last breath go out of him. I'd never seen the like before. I'd never been where one sees the call of death. The call of death! It told me something I never knew before, but no matter what, you wouldn't know it if I told you, and I couldn't tell you if I tried. Now see here! You see here! Nancy forcibly interrupted. I'm going to have my say, and it won't take me long. I'm done with the life I've led and done with you fellows. That plunder is going back to the bank. That's what I'm going to do for a starter on the new road. I knew you guys would watch me. I reckoned I'd better not take this gent to the place where the stuff is hid, not till I was dead sure you weren't trailing me. So I took him to a fake place first, just to find out, and you and your push were on hand to nail us. You've got us, all right, but you'll not get the coin. I fooled you, and I'll keep you fooled. You'll get nothing from me. She had told the whole story in these few passionate words, a story that might have filled a volume, and the look on Gridley's face was one to have appalled a less fearless speaker. He turned quickly to his confederates and fiercely cried, We'll see about that, pals. We'll find out whether she'll speak. Pull the boots off this gospel sharp and shove his feet into the fire. She brought him into this mess. Let's see whether she'll pull him out. 
She can do it only by squealing. If not, we'll burn its feet off then. Say, cried Patsy, cut that out, you fellas. Cut nothing. You dry up, or we'll cut out the tongue you talk with. Nancy Nordick had turned as white as a sheet. Keep quiet, my girl, and be brave, said Maybrick, observing her. Reveal nothing, no matter what these scoundrels do. That is your new duty. I'll stick, sir, if you say it, said Nancy, but she was trembling from head to foot. Oh, you will, eh? thundered Gridley. We'll see whether you will. Grab that gospel sharp, two of you, and— But there was no grabbing done of that nature. Gridley's furious commands were drowned by the crash of a falling door, the rending of blinds, and the breaking of shuttered windows, at which the heads of policemen and leveled revolvers instantly appeared. Patsy Garvin guessed the truth, and a yell broke from him. Hurrah, Zambo, it's all off! The chief is here! Patsy was right. While the words were still on his lips, Nick, Chick, and Danny tore through the hall and rushed into the room with weapons drawn and blood in their eyes. Gridley vented an oath and snatched up one of Patsy's revolvers, still lying on the table. A bullet from Nick's weapon broke the rascal's wrist. He fell to the floor, howling with pain. Chick had a gun under McGill's nose, and Morgan and Phelan had thrown up their hands. There was very little to it after that, insofar as opposition was concerned. Within five minutes, the crooks were in irons, their captives liberated, and Nancy Nordeck, relieved of her fears and started, indeed, on the better road. Through her, the entire amount of stolen funds were restored to the bank, or, more properly, through her and the Carters. She never was prosecuted for any of her past misdemeanors. Nick Carter made sure of that, and equally sure that Gridley and his confederates received the most severe penalty of law. Nick's deductions had been entirely correct after the disclosures Chick had made, and the remarkable message from Patsy had showed them the way. Nick was right, too, in thinking that Kate Crandall, though informed of the facts, had suppressed them only with a feeling of jealous hatred and revenge for Maybrick and Harriet Farley, whose relief and gratitude over the happy turn of affairs scarce need be mentioned. The End Well, folks, that's it for now. The final Nick Carter mystery story for 2022. <laughs> wow, it's been a journey. I'd like to thank you all for joining me on my little adventure to see if I could actually do this and it's turned out to be one of the best things I've ever done with my life. I really do hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I have, and if you have, might I suggest that you support the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link on my webpage. On a mobile phone, it's that coffee cup image on the bottom left corner of your screen, or there's a button on the page with the words Buy Me a Coffee clearly on it. Or on several podcast platforms, there's also a link that says something like Support the show, and it will take you to the correct page. Either way, thank you in advance if you do decide to support the show. I truly do appreciate it. Well, gang, up next in the podcast, I'll have two tales of horror from the master storyteller himself, Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart, and The Cask of Amontillado. Following that, Washington Irving's spooky tale of the headless horseman, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> After that, I'm going to take a little break. And then a few Christmas stories for the holidays. The Nick Carter Mysteries will begin once again in January 2023. Once again, folks, I'm so grateful and humbled that you have taken time to listen to me spin these stories. I can't tell you how much I truly appreciate it. Okay, I've rambled long enough, gang. I'd better wrap this up. As always, thanks for listening. Keep sharing the stories. And be a good human. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>